it worked. This is an HP 95LX Palm Top computer. It was introduced in 1991 in collaboration with Lotus Corporation. At the time, Lotus was one of the biggest software developers and a major power in business applications. This machine was HP's first DOS-based pocket computer. It wasn't completely DOS compatible as it had some issues with the screen, but it had included a PCMCAA slot on the side and an RS-232 serial port. For additional support, underneath this little door, there was an infrared port, as well as a place to put a small backup battery. The battery was used to preserve the memory when the main batteries ran low. The whole machine runs on a NEC V20 CPU running at 5.3 megahertz. It has 512K of memory and about half a meg of storage. For power, it uses a pair of AA batteries. These batteries would power it for quite a while, and as noted, the coin battery could keep the memory active when the main batteries went dead. Let's power it up. When you first power the unit up, it first asks for a date and time and a couple of pieces of basic information, like a name, a title, and a company. This is used in the notes and other applications for sort of default values. Loaded into the ROM is a series of basic applications, like a filer that lets you navigate the file system and move files around. There are other applications such as an appointment manager, a phone app, memos, things like that, and of course, Lotus123 itself. It's hard to overstate how important Lotus was in the business market. Lotus123 was basically the business app that everyone wanted to use and everyone did use. The original spreadsheet in the business market was VisiCalc, written in 1979 by Dan Bricklin for the Apple II computer. As PC-DOS machines took over the market, Lotus123 became the de facto business application that all businesses used for everything from basic inventory management to money planning to charting to graphing. Basically, anything that you could put into a spreadsheet, people put into Lotus123. Entire careers were based around this single app. Having it installed on a small handheld computer was amazing at the time. It's also crystal clear that I've forgotten 99% of how to use this app. Oh well. What I'm really interested in doing today is getting this machine connected up to external services. The only way to really do that on this machine is to use the Datacom application. Datacom uses the built-in serial port on the side of the HP to talk to other devices over a hardware connection. This serial protocol has been in place basically since the early 70s and is pretty well understood. It can do data transfers anywhere from 300 bits per second up to quite a high value. Obviously this machine can't go particularly fast, but we'll, let's see what we can do. Now this machine uses a two millimeter pitch JST connector. I have some here. This one's not the right size. This is like a 2.5 or something like that. But I have another box that has the correct connectors. These are two millimeter JST connectors. You can get these boxes basically off Amazon. They come with the connectors, two, three, four, and five pins, as well as the metal crimps that get attached to the end of the wire. These get inserted into these little plastic connectors. The first step is to just define the right size. Next, we're gonna need some wire. This is like 20 gauge hookup wire I picked up off of Amazon. These little kits are super handy to have around. We're only gonna need about, oh, 10 inches or so. I just need four wires to make the connection because that's all you need for a simple serial port. Next, we prep the wires to crimp the connectors onto them. This is really just a matter of stripping off the insulation at the very end of the wire and then putting them in the crimp tools. This can be a little tricky because the connectors are very, very small and having big, fat, sausage-like fingers doesn't make this any easier. Eventually, I got all four crimped properly. Now it was time to insert those into the connector. It really doesn't matter what order they go in at this stage since I'll be able to wire them up in the proper order later on. 
Okay, time for a test fit. If all goes well, this should just slot right in. Looks good. So you have to be a bit careful with these crimpon connectors because they're not particularly secure. So what I'm doing is just putting a zip tie around the wires to add some strain relief to the whole connection. This will make it a little bit more secure and harder to pull apart by mistake. Next thing I needed was a DB25 connector. The DB25 is sort of the standard connection used on most serial ports. Fortunately, I have a box full of RS-232 hardware that I could use. I use these little ammo boxes to store all my parts. They're incredibly handy and easy to organize. Sure, there are some that call me a pack rat. I just like to think I'm prepared. Yeah, that's the ticket. Ah, that's what I'm looking for. This little board is called a Wi-Fi 232 internet modem. It's made by Paul Rickards and is available on his website, biosrhythm.com. In essence, it's a Wi-Fi microcontroller attached to the hardware to drive a DB25 RS-232 port. In order to use this board, we're going to need to map out the lines that come through this four pin connector from the HP95. First thing we need to do is write down what the current pins are and what color wires are being used on each. Conveniently, the HP95 uses the exact same pinout as the HP48GX handheld graphing calculator. So looking up on the internet, we can determine what pins we need to map from the HP unit over to what would be a DB25 serial port. So what we're looking at here is a female RS-232 port. When looking at them from this side, a, D a DB25 is numbered from right to left. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven along the top row there. For our purposes, we're only gonna need one, two, three, and seven. For our little workbench setup here, what we're gonna do is use these little jumper wires, which I've bent into a little bit of an S shape and stick them right into the pinholes. That way we can just use an alligator clip to just connect each pin from the DB25 over to the cable that we've made on the HP. Since I'm not 100% sure we got the wiring right on the HP cable, this is a great way to test this out. This little wireless controller uses a mini USB connector. Seriously old school. It uses it for power, so all I need to do is plug that into my laptop and the module will power up. With the module powered up and connected to the serial port, I was getting garbage in the terminal program. This is actually a good thing. It means that the device was sending data on the transmit line and receiving things on the receive line, but there was something wrong in the protocol. RS-232 ports and serial ports use a baud rate to set the speed, the number of data bits, the parity settings, and stop bits. All of those things have to be correct in order to have a proper handshake. When they're not correct, you get garbage. The most common mismatch is when the baud rates do not match. So resetting the board just generated more garbage. This is still Okay, it means we just need to figure out what the baud rate is. I spent a frustrating 15 or 20 minutes going through every baud rate setting on the HP, but none of them would match. I knew that the board worked, it was responding the way it was supposed to, but anything from 300 baud up to 19.2 kilobaud, nothing was answering properly. Something was still not correct. I even tried fiddling around with the data bits and the stop bits. Still wouldn't work. I decided the next step would be to hook up the wireless board to my ThinkPad. I've done this before. I used the ThinkPad to connect to the PDP-11, so I knew the serial ports worked. What I needed to do is just put a series of adapters in to hook up the serial port on the wireless adapter to the USB port on the laptop. I've done this before. It's not a problem. It's kind of weird having a card that has two serial port connections to it, but whatever. 
The board shows up fine on the USB port. The next step would be to try to figure out what baud rates it's set to. Baud rates vary from, you could actually go as low as 150 baud, but let's start at 300. I walk through all the different settings, 300, 1200, 2400, etc. Every one of them would connect and would show garbage until I hit 38.4 kilobaud, 38,400 baud. That is apparently what this card is set to. And the reason it didn't work on the HP was the HP can't go that fast. So what I needed to do was reset the baud rate on the Wi-Fi board to be something that it could manage. So let's set it down to 19.2 kilobaud. Here the board resets to 19.2 and of course we get garbage, which is what's expected. So reconnecting to it at 19.2 Yay, we get proper menus and commands. We're ready to go. I reconnected the board back to the HP, went into the terminal program, set the baud rate to 19.2, made sure the rest of the settings were correct, and went back into terminal mode. It worked. We were getting commands. Clear text back and forth with the Wi-Fi module. We were online. There's a great subreddit called Retro Battle Stations that I subscribe to. They run a Telnet-based BBS. It actually has dial-in analog lines also. It's a great way to test out your workstations in a very simple connection. This Wi-Fi module emulates an old Hayes modem. So when you type ATDT and then a target address, it telnets to the address. In this case, the BBS is at bbs.fostex.com. Typing on the little keyboard takes a little getting used to. It's certainly not touch and type, but even for my big fingers, you get used to it pretty quickly. I've sped things up a little bit here. I found that the HP can't quite move at 19.2 kilobaud. There are block delays and kind of bursts of speed. That's definitely not coming from the Wi-Fi module. I think the serial port on the HP just can't quite keep up with the 19.2 kilobaud throughput. Now that we've established that the wiring is working correctly, it was time to do something about this rat's nest of wires. Back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, it was pretty common to use a solder cup type of connector to attach your wires. As an aside, I'd like to call your attention to this top-notch camera work. True professional videography going on here. I'm so proud. Because it's been a good 15 years since I used solder cup connectors, I needed to use the multimeter and the continuity tester to make sure that I hadn't shorted anything out. Fortunately, everything seemed to work correctly, so we're good to go. The next step is to fire up the 3D printer and print out some new hoods for the connector. Remember though, this is a DB25 connector, which is only about an inch and a half long. Something seemed a little off here, but the print looked great, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Turns out I simply selected the wrong model from the download. I reprinted the job using the correct connectors and these fit much better. These hoods look great and they just snap together when complete. I'll put the link in the description down below. One thing did come readily apparent though, the hole on the back of the connector wasn't really big enough to take these four wires. It needed to be modified. To do this, I used the tried and true method of using a, a small handheld rotary tool. I'm all in on Ryobi's OnePlus system, so I used theirs. 
Back in the day, we used to call these Dremel tools because the first manufacturer of them was Dremel, oddly enough. These are great for making modifications to 3D prints. They do have the unfortunate side effect of sounding an awful lot like a dental tool. So if you have family members that don't like that sound, better close the door. I could have also just modified the SDL file that I had downloaded, but there's something particularly enjoyable about using a Dremel tool to carve a piece into the shape that you need. After finishing, the pieces fit together exactly the way they were supposed to, and the tension of the wires on the back of the connector made it so th nothing was going to slip around. I was pretty happy with the result. After snapping it together, it was pretty rock solid. All that remained now is to put it all back together and give it a one final test. I plugged everything back in and plugged it back into the HP and powered it up again. I turned it on and got garbage again. Are you kidding me? This was just working. What the heck? After questioning my life choices, I realized I had simply forgotten to save the settings last time I was in the setup screen. So the board had naturally reverted back to 38.4 kilobaud. During attempt number two, things worked exactly as expected. The HP came up, it connected up to the Wi-Fi board, and I was ready to go. All done. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and would like to see more, please click the like and subscribe button down below or leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you.